So, um, my name is Suzanne Zylonis. I'm Director of Admissions and Development. I'd like to welcome you to the spring session of free online seminars at Wakefield Country Day School. When campus is closed um, in Virginia on Friday, March 13, due to the coronavirus pandemic, WCBS was fully prepared and started distance learning almost immediately. As we've been asked to stay at home by Governor Northam, People may have some extra time, and so we're opening our doors to the larger WCBS community to join in on these special seminars offered by our distinguished adjunct faculty. WCBS is a preschool through 12 independent school located in Huntley, Virginia. We're actively accepting enrollment applications and have 15 full Huntley scholarships available. Please visit our website, wcbsva.org, for more information. And now on to our speaker, Dr. Hugh Hill. He received his BA from Washington and Lee, his MD at the Medical College of Virginia, his JD at UVA, and is currently a professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, we're going to ask you all to hold off on your questions until after Dr. Hill has given his lecture and also um, put your uh, computers on mute until you ask those questions. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, and I'm gonna start my timer here for 30 minutes, uh, which is how long I hope to be able to restrain myself to. And one caveat, I'm only an assistant professor. Uh, academics tend to be picky about that sort of thing. Um, I hope you can see the um, slides on your screen. Suzanne, do we have that? Yes, we do. Um, Suzanne, just checking in. Do we, yes. do we have yes. the slides? Yes, sir. Very good. Okay. So <clears throat> let me do the traditional disclosures thing <clears throat> and explain that these are, um, these are um, they're not Hopkins, they're not Wakefields. And the way this field is changing, they'll be out of date tomorrow or later this afternoon. Uh, I also have no conflicts of interest, which for the students I'll explain is what you say when you want to reveal uh, you, you have or do not have a bias. Nobody's paying me to talk about hydroxyquinolone or Dove soap. And um, I gave a talk to a bunch of uh, psychotherapists uh, last fall about the law of telemental health. I was going through my litany and just briefly said, I have no conflicts. And they all started laughing. And I couldn't figure out why for about 30 seconds. And then I realized, well, psychotherapists think everybody's got trouble. So that's why they were laughing at me. So here are my goals for this. After you sit through this, you'll be able to appreciate some differences between viruses and bacteria. You'll recall that viruses only live inside cells. And you'll have a better sense of how many and how varied viruses are you'll be able to recite several ways viruses spread. And then um, an obscure goal, but I, I'm still hoping to reach it, is that at the end of this, you'll be more interested in our better preparation for the next, and inevitably there will be a next one of these. So I understand things to history, so let me just go back a little bit. Um, viruses are microorganisms, and we didn't know anything about microorganisms until the 17th century when a Dutch lens grinder got some pond water up and saw some little things swimming around in it and called them animalcules. The Pasteur in the mid 19th century uh, started identifying bacteria and realized that bacteria do things. He first found microbes in spoiled vinegar in addition to the expected yeast with his microscope and he figured out how to kill those rods, those, um, those rod bacteria that were causing the spoilage by controlled heating and cooling. The process was called pasteurization, which you may recognize as being what's done to your milk, not by the cow, but by the processing before it's uh, store shelf. And then finally, uh, he, he identified the fact that microorganisms cause disease, which was the great leap in Western medicine. Uh, he, he came across rabies and he couldn't with his microscope identify the causative agent, and we'll come back to why that's so later. Um, then Robert Koch in the 1880s uh, came up with the famous Koch's postulates about how to identify and associate a, um, 
an organism with an infection and to be definitive about it. And we still follow those. And here's a slide of Robert Koch taken uh, from the grounds of um, the Charité Hospital in Berlin, which is uh, something I got to visit a couple of years ago. And it's a holy place for me because so much great science has been done there. And they are the lead in studying the current virus in Germany and possibly in all of Europe. So now I'm going to talk about the first um, virus that was actually discovered. And this is at the end of the 19th century, the 1890s. Um, there was um, a virus, well, they didn't know what it was. They knew that the tobacco had uh, a disease on the leaves. Not that you'd want to smoke these anyway, but back then some people did, uh, the unenlightened, and they uh, could see that this was uh, not so great. It was interfering with people to work on that. And this is how they identified the tobacco mosaic virus was to be um, identified. And, and postulates said that um, it, you had to be able to isolate the organism and grow it in pure broth. So they ground up these leaves and they didn't get any growth. What the heck? So they took the extracts and they put them back on a leaf and they got growth. The same disease appeared. So they filtered the extracts. They knew how to filter out bacteria at the time. They were making these filters that were used in hotels and public places to filter out bacteria and keep things clean and prevent. Um, though they filtered out the bacteria, they put those extracts back on the leaves and they got growth. So they postulated that there was something in there that they couldn't identify through their microscopes. They thought it was a liquid. They called it a slimy liquid. So they named it uh, for the Latin for slimy liquid, which is virus, which is fortuitous because um, virus by the Middle Ages in Latin had come to also have the connotation of uh, snake venom. So it was pretty nasty. And here's a picture of a mosaic virus. Those rods are 300 nanometers long, and a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So it gives you a little sense of the size of them. So what are viruses, finally? And I'll stop geeking out on the history. Um, <clears throat> they're microorganisms, and you have to have electroscopy to see them. Um, you can, with the naked eye, see things. The light microscope can see things. And the um, um, electron microscopy, an enormously small uh, particle and uh, allow us to study it. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a new virus was discovered called the cornucopia virus, which is two uh, microns in size, and it actually is visible to uh, light microscopy. Um, <clears throat> but they, viruses, here's some important stuff. Um, so uh, they're obligate intracellular parasites. They can the cell. They are, well, they can survive in a form that's inactive, but they, they don't parasitize or do anything unless they're inside a cell. They invade the cells and they take over the protein manufacturing mechanisms of the cells. Um, they hijack it, and they only reproduce inside the cell. So you remember how tobacco mosaic virus was recovered. What had happened was um, it, those uh, that slimy had gotten back onto clean tobacco leaves and got onto those leaves and reproduced and caused the disease. So uh, what are, viruses are made of deoxynucleic acid or or ribonucleic acid and a coat called a capsid. And sometimes they have a lipid envelope and that lipid envelope will return to because that's important to what's going on right now. Um, okay, so here's an electron microscopic picture of a phage. Phages are plant virus, scary looking little things to me. And they're actually injecting their um, DNA or RNA into, um, oh, I think phages are all RNA. RNA content into a cell where that uh, RNA will take over um, the blueprint process and the manufacture of proteins within the cell. And it, it's all random. Um, it's, it's good not to, it's good to remind ourselves not to think uh, teleologically about viruses. There's no plan. They don't uh, get together with other viruses and say, you attack there and I'll attack here. It's random. They're just trying to live survive and reproduce.
um, because of their programming. And that, what happens most of the time is they randomly contact a cell membrane until they touch a receptor, which they like. Part of the virus likes that receptor, and that's where they tag on. Even the phage viruses I showed you had arrived at those spots because they liked a receptor on the cell. But this is more like what the coronavirus is doing with um, uh, attaching a spike. And you've been reading something probably about how uh, one of the vaccine strategies is to try to get at that spike. Here's another way viruses enter the cell. The cell will sometimes form a protrusion to get some extracellular liquid into it for nu nutrients or whatever it needs. And you see how that folds over and encapsulates. And this is, in fact, how Ebola gets into the cell, that particular virus. So inside the cell, um, and they get in, they take over the, uh, the production of uh, proteins inside the cell, and um, they make enough particles until pop, they come out. So what that means is, unlike a bacteria, which grows and increases like that, these things get into the cell and there seems to be a latent period and then they are produce enough viruses to come out and boom. And of course that kills the cell. Things that can do damage to it as a result of them taking over the mechanism. So they only replicate inside a cell. How can you make more virus to study or to use in the laboratory or to work with to try to make a vaccine? Um, and uh, there are, in the last decade or so, some, some ways to grow them on cell cultures. But for the most part, and this is the way flu virus is uh, manufactured to create flu vaccine, they're grown in fertilized chicken. Uh, they're injected into the eggs. It's not always by hand. There are machines that do this too. And um, the virus grows in there, and then they extract the virus from the eggs. So one little quick side story. I was at one point earlier in my career, the department chief for the Hagerstown, um, Maryland emergency department. And one of the doctors I had working for me part-time, his full-time job was as an infectious disease specialist working at um, Fort D, which is a facility where we don't do biological warfare research. Well, because it's a facility where we don't do biological warfare research, it has a um, a level, what we used to call a level seven, now they call a level four uh, uh, containment areas like a smallpox or a, uh, polio. And uh, he was the officer of the day at the desk and a man came and said, I have this case level four containment center. And uh, the man was wearing brown shoes, a dark suit and um, Gary knew that he was a FBI guy, because back then they all wore their own shoes. Um, and he said, I'm sorry, sir, I'm not authorized to do that. And he said, get on the phone and call your CO. And uh, the CO said, all right, you can allow those that case to go into the level four, but you, he has to open it and show you its contents. And he opened it, and inside in um, foam uh, lined beds were and uh, Gary was able to get from the man uh, only this much more information, that they had stopped um, <clears throat> some people who were about to put these eggs into a reservoir for a very large American city. They didn't know what it was, but they thought it might be dangerous, and so it was brought for study to Port Dietrich. That's how they grow viruses. So viruses come in two varieties. There are some that have deoxyribonucleic acid, and some just have ribonucleic blueprint for all cells that we know about. The, the RNA tends to be the messenger, the transcription device that goes from the DNA to the manufacturing of the proteins. DNA viruses, as you would expect, use their own blueprints. Um, they have a lower mutation rate like a pox virus, like smallpox viruses, so they tend to be pretty stable. RNA has to take over the cell's mechanisms from the very outset to do anything. They have a very high mutation rate. So pox virus tends to be pretty stable. Flu virus here uh, because they're mutating. And so that's, that's what's happening with the RNA. They all have a coat, a capsid, and some have an envelope. Coats are proteins. And the envelopes are a protein lipid mixture. It's a fatty uh, cell and um, it's a, chemically it's a fat. Uh, and 
<laughs> that becomes important later. All right, so viruses are ubiquitous. Everything and everybody is infected. Uh, you eat and breathe billions of viruses every single day. Our genomes even include viruses. Um, some of the DNA that we don't use is thought to be old virus that's in the system that can come out later for various purposes. So let's just to give you a sense of how numerous they are, just take viruses that infect bacteria in the world's waters, salt and fresh, just the phages that, that infect bacteria. Now, you know how I showed you that picture and you get a sense of the scale when you're talking about a millionth of a meter or a billionth of a meter. Um, but if you took those viruses and put them end to end, the line would stretch out to intergalactic distances. It's just, there's so very, very, very many of them. Now, when you compare biomass, um, the, they are only a small sliver of the pie chart. Uh, bacteria are more common, other forms of cells are more common. Uh, other form, other cells are more common. There are hundreds of millions of different viruses. Over 300,000 of them infect mammals and over 200 are known to infect humans. So how do they spread? Um, well, uh, so here's some examples, vectors, yellow fever. Um, Walter Reed is uh, for whom the famous military hospital Army Medical Center in DC is named, uh, was called the conqueror of yellow fever. Uh, not because he identified the virus and killed it, but because he figured out about the vector and started oiling the waters where they were reproducing and reduced the amount of um, uh, yellow fever that was running through people that were trying to dig the Panama Canal, and he made the Panama Canal possible. He also did that in other places in the Caribbean. Uh, contact, um, her herpes viruses, there's a whole long lecture available, um, which is sure to induce um, um, a, a, an epidemic of uh, uh, personal social isolation and um, uh, <laughs> make the young people more careful. Uh, their parents might like me to include that, but there's not really time to do that right now. The sexually transmitted diseases are uh, pretty scary. Um, so I'm gonna go back up. Direct contact, uh, like with herpes, uh, indirect contact, droplets on fomites. You've been hearing about this. Fomite is just the term that we use for what the substance is on that might make you pick it up and then get it. So you've probably heard about this when you've had conjunctivitis. Your doctor has told you, use your own washcloth. <clears throat> Be careful because it can spread to other people's eyes uh, indirectly, not by eyeball to eyeball contact. Uh, it can also, viruses can also spread by contamination in the food and the water. I told you about the billions of viruses that we eat every day and breathe. Uh, in medical supplies, uh, when you get a blood transfusion, uh, the whole hepatitis um, with hepatitis C from years ago, you remember, and shared needles. Where I work in Baltimore, this is a horrible problem. Uh, and a lot of uh, shared viruses happen that way. And then, of course, the famous way we think about now is airborne. So there's been some controversy with this virus about how much of it is airborne and how much is by contact. The World Health Organization was saying at first that it's mostly contact, um, but I, I think it has now been pretty generally airborne, in fact. And maybe that is a, a, a labeling issue because as you can see, when there's a spray from a sneeze or a cough, the stuff's gonna go all over the place. And if it lands on a surface and then you touch that surface, that's how you can have the contact spread. It doesn't have to be shaking hands. Um, so if you count uh, only that as um, contact spread, then you're gonna say it's all airborne. If you count this as via the airborne droplets falling onto something, then you're gonna say it's, uh, it's all airborne. But probably best estimates, 10% of the current problem is contact spread. Uh, enough to be careful about it, but uh, enough, uh, enough airborne to be more worried about that. The other thing I want you to particularly notice in this slide is the representation of how the size of the droplets make a difference. Uh, the current virus is amongst the, the, the particles it's making in us, in our 
passageways or arrest passageways are on the larger side. So they're not thought to be suspended in the air for hours and days uh, and not thought to go as far, but to have gravity bring them down to surfaces or to the earth or to the floor within a, a, an hour, probably, maybe up to three hours. And some of the stuff you've been reading about, you may have been reading about the uh, incredible distance um, that these sprays can go. Actually, those were um, <clears throat> models that were uh, spread, <coughs> that models that were uh, used of, uh, of how uh, a big sneeze will spread particulate matter that's been aerosolized down to something very fine, and then the authors reasoned from that. And I hope there's time for me to talk about why you have to read what you're reading skeptically. So surface spread, let's talk about that for viruses a little bit. Different surfaces mean different survival. We know that paper and cardboard soft surfaces, brief, maybe three hours, maybe less. Um, one report said an hour only. Hard surfaces are longer. I have seen reports all over the place. So maybe this is a good point to stop and talk about the sources and what you're reading and to urge you to read them very skeptically. Um, We've, one of my colleagues said recently in a broadcast that we've lost our minds in our desperation to get information out there. I know everybody is appropriately talking about the need for protective, personal protective equipment, PPE, and I share that concern by the lack of science on this with coronavirus. Um, and so we're looking at all the other viruses trying to reason and make sense of what's going on. And, um, Otherwise reputable um, journals are doing pre-pubs and pre-prints of reports that they get um, that have not been peer reviewed, have not been substantiated, are based on very, very few cases. Um, and uh, just basically let me offer you uh, to say I did this and that happened or I saw this, that's not evidence, that's not science, that's anecdote. And the plural of anecdote is not evidence. But on the other hand, we can't ignore these things. Um, I'm getting off into coronavirus, which uh, Dr. Martin is going to talk about next week, who applies to any viral uh, epidemic when you're desperate for information, how you've got to be careful um, those reports. Because four weeks ago, a, a very small publication uh, came out with a very small number of patients that ear, nose, and throat doctors had um, uh, seen who turned out to have coronavirus who had lost their sense of smell, which uh, some people poo-pooed because they said, well, if you've got a cold, you're blocked up and you don't have your sense of smell. But that has become uh, so important to us that it's one of our screening questions now for coronavirus. So different viruses have different effects. This one we'll talk about next week. Um, but all the different viruses that we're that I'm trying to in, uh, show you that are so varied and so ubiquitous uh, have their own characteristics and their own effects. Uh, if it's on a surface, it's still got to be carried to a portal of entry. So if you touch something um, and then suck your thumb, pick your nose, rub your eyes, it can get into your respiratory tract. Um, but not if you don't. That's why the not touching the face thing has been so. So in general, viruses were thought to live longer if there was less sunlight. Well, that makes sense. Sunlight tends to be sterilizing at a lower temperature and a lower humidity, which is counterintuitive for me because one would think that the viruses would live longer if they were in um, something that resembled the intracellular milieu in which they're going to reproduce. Now, this gives me the opportunity to talk about live. Are viruses alive? There are some people that say that viruses are not living organisms, partially because they don't have their own metabolic processes. And this may be kind of a scholastic terminological issue, um, but to scientists, it matters a great deal to, as part of their understanding. The best explanation that I've read says that viruses are not alive when they're not in a cell. But once they kick in and start going, you have to admit that they're alive. So that takes me down to 22. Um, about how to reduce airborne spread. Um, yeah, let's go back to that. Look at that again. 
So uh, avoiding or cleansing surfaces that might have been coughed or sneezed upon. Hmm? And then of course, reducing the contact with the portals like I talked about. So directing coughs and sneezes <laughs> away from people has a lot to do with it. But masks, there've been lots of uh, things about masks, but every year in Asia, they, they're trained to wear masks during places like Hong Kong and Singapore and South Korea have done so much better with the current epidemic. Just think about a mask as a percentage um, enhancer or reducing exposure. They're not perfect. I've got my surgical mask on, I cough or I sneeze, and I can actually feel the sides of it blow out a little bit as some of it escapes. But if you cough or sneeze into your mask, and only maybe 20% of what you would have gotten out uh, goes out. And then uh, six feet away from you is wearing a mask and they inhale and maybe only 20% of that gets in. You're talking about down to 4% already. So just think about it as an odds enhancer and masks really work. There are some people that attribute uh, controlling viral spread to masks in Asia as being the, the critical factor. And then of course the other things we're doing is distancing and isolation. Talk about the surfaces for a minute. Um, actually, soap and water are the best. Remember I talked about the lip of the fat, the chemi biochemical chemistry of the fat part of the envelope around coronavirus. Um, it, the the uh, soap has got a lipophilic, uh, fat loving, hydrophilic, water loving end, each one of the molecules. And so the molecules, um, fat loving stuff, gloms on to the uh, envelope of the virus, the water loving end is all around it. And so when you rinse, it washes away. It's also possible that the soap is dissolving. We'll talk about alcohol in high insufficiently high percentages. Um, it probably denatures the uh, capsid or the envelope of the virus. Uh, denaturing is like an unfolding of the protein, like when you fry an egg. The, the reason that it uh, seems to become solid is because it, the proteins are unfolding and they're denaturing. And then bleach uh, actually oxidizes the capsule. So he, I don't know if you can see it or not, but here's some recommended bleach is about 5% sodium hypochlorite. And if you take a one to 100 reduction in that, uh, you're getting down to about, um, 500 parts per million, which is the recommended amount. But then at that concentration, you still have to have it on the surface for a couple of minutes. Um, some people say 10. And then if you're soaking something in it, it's got to be even longer. But those are the recommendations and are available on the NIH's website. So uh, I'm because I want to talk about emerging viruses. Why are we seeing viruses? SARS and MERS and Hantavirus and Ebola and now Corona. Why are, why are we seeing these emerging viruses? Emerging viruses means uh, new ones or old ones that become pathogenic, become able to, um, uh, and scientists even talk about emerging viruses as viruses that change their virulency, their ability to be dangerous and cause disease profile. Sometimes they'll be stable, viruses will be stable in a population. And I'll talk about an example of one for humans. There are um, uh, art pieces uh, from Egypt from 1500 BC, 4,500 years ago, that clearly show a withered limb, which it, it's hard to think about what would cause that except polio. Um, we think polio was around, and then all of a sudden, in the 20th century, we started seeing outbreaks of it. And um, kids getting it and um, being terribly damaged, killed or paralyzed by it, uh, as was FDR. So why did that happen? Well, the reason it happened is plumbing. Back in the day, um, kids were exposed at a very young age to, uh, the uh, poop stool out in the streets where people plung it. Uh, I know a lot of folks had uh, outhouses, but there was still some use of the streets for that. And so the thought is that 
once that stopped happening, uh, the kids didn't have that immunity to polio at that time, they'd be exposed to it later and it would cause the disease. The other way, another way viruses are a mental chain. So the Hanta virus, the one that started in the Southwest United States, um, seems to have been there, but then you had this explosion of the wild mouse population when you had a big rainfall after a long period of drought. And then they would go into camp areas or where people would go and poop, and that uh, poop would get aerosolized, the mouse poop would get aerosolized, and get into the lungs of the people and cause deadly, deadly disease. We had a woman who worked at one of the big box stores, clean, having was assigned to clean out an area that some stuff had been stored for a long time that had been shipped in from Southwest United States and lots of rat and mice species. And she wound up in our ICU for two weeks and had to be in a medically induced coma. Fully recovered, thanks God, but it was a, a real example of, of, they went back and traced it later and found that it was hantavirus. Sometimes uh, viruses spread because of us. We go to where not so many men have gone before, and that's the yellow fever is an example of that when they went to the tropics without having the natural um, immunity. Mutation is another way that viruses emerge. There's some thought that possibly there had been an earlier, milder strain of the Spanish flu, but then in 1918, it mutated to the super dangerous kind. Um, remember, the RNA ones are the ones that are more likely to do it. And then, of course, the one everybody's concerned about, especially with coronavirus, is how, how do um, viruses jump? So the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus has a 30%, whoops, there goes my 30 minute timer, so I'm gonna zip along here. Um, the, um, th that jumped from camels in the Middle East, you might expect that. Sometimes they jump to a dead end host, which means that the host can't spread it any further and the only way any subsequent infections of the same species or happen is from a jump. But other times it jumps and then causes human to human spread. So I'm gonna show you what the real problem with emerging viruses is, the source of all of our problems with emerging viruses and um, why we've got to take seriously the high likelihood that we're gonna have another one of these and it could be worse. Um, so this is a population curve, and you see we're at least up to 6 billion now on Earth. And that little notch down there before it starts up, I don't know if you can see that, that's the black, that's how little effect that had on the overall population. Um, this is um, uh, an indication. And finally, on the slide set, if you have access to it, if you're interested, the top reference to Vincent Racanello's uh, lectures it, that was, I'm highly indebted to him for my preparation. A long series of uh, talks and videos and a great resource. Uh, his blogs are, uh, are up to date. Um, I would urge you, if you're going to look at anything, to look at that one. So fur further deponent saith not, and I'd like to take questions if we've got a couple minutes left. Great. Well, I've got a question, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, hear. Dr. Martin, thank you for coming on. Everybody, doc, talk more specifically to the coronavirus next week. So, well, you you will be a hard act to uh, to follow, but uh, I did want to commend you for excellent presentation. Um, maybe you could discuss a little bit about how a virus mutates. I know that's sort of a complex question, uh, but. Uh, Maybe you can give it your best shot and maybe also speak a little bit on um, antigenic shift as opposed to antigenic drift. Did you get um, those? I'm not going to take a stab at, I, I won't take a stab at the second one, but insofar as the first one, um, the, especially the RNA viruses, they're, they're basically genetically unstable. Um, and and they're changing all the time as they as they reproduce within the cells. And it's thought that almost all of the mutated uh, versions of the RNA viruses die or become ineffective. But occasionally, one gets out that that is more effective or more dangerous or can cause disease. 
um, just just the process of how they uh, grab the um, the protein making machinery within a cell uh, and then run it through um, the coding the, the same machinery that the cell has to make proteins normally but they're running it through their own coding system um, and uh, they can they can make uh, the, that that system can make thousands of proteins in a second um, but that process itself is the level of cellular uh, mechanics now is I, I hope that's responsive but maybe you can um, offer more in answer to that yourself so so it's possible that a uh, virus could mutate to a more virulent form or it could conversely mutate to uh, maybe something less virulent uh, I think there was some speculation that's what happened with the Spanish flu that uh, over a period of time that it became less virulent. That's at least yes, that's and I have read. Yeah, I, I've read that initially it might have gone up, but then later less. Um, so on the island of Guam, uh, there were no deaths from Spanish flu. They they um, isolated very strongly but you know that that virus got there eventually at some point and so why didn't it hurt people then well it, it might have been the down mutated uh, and if something odds are i am told that it is more likely to down mutate than to mutate in terms of virulence which makes common sense to me thank you Dr. Hill, I had a um, I had a meeting last night with some parents and uh, um, related to school, but we did obviously talk a lot about this um, pandemic and uh, the idea of um, of herd uh, what is it herd immunity came up. Um, herd immunity. Yeah. yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well. I, I know that that's a hope, but um, let me cite you the example of measles, which is um, one that sort of inhibits my my enthusiasm for that answer. Um, every um, hundreds of thousands of people would get measles, and um, Dr. Martin's uh, I'm sure remembers that from his practice. And despite that. Um, the fact that those people that had the measles would then be immune every year you'd have another huge number of cases causing damages to um, fetuses uh, we didn't really get a handle on or a control of measles even though it rendered the the we had a vaccine so um and then the other question is immunity still up in the air I mean, maybe we'll talk about that next week, but uh, still some question about um, how long people are immune. I, reasoning from tests that were done on other um, COVID viruses in the past, other cold viruses like this, people should have some immunity. Uh, World Health Organization, there's no evidence that it confers, infection with COVID confers immunity, but and the news media picked that up and said, ah, you see, it doesn't confer immunity. But that's not what they said. They said there's no evidence. And I tried to talk about how lack of evidence is not evidence of lack. The, um, uh, it's th that statement may be true. It just may not be available yet. We, we just don't know. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from our um, participants? I sent in um, a question. This is Paul Larner. Sorry, Dr. let me see if I can thing. bring that up. I think if you yeah, close yeah. your share screen now, Hugh, Dr. Hill, um, okay. you should be able to see his. Where will, where, let me see if I can. Uh, will it be? Let's see if uh, I, I don't want you to waste your effort here. Rats. More. Okay. 
Ah, well, let me let me get to my my questions Got it. were. Okay. Thanks again for uh, making this cogent and very uh, timely presentation. My my first question is: other than sharing the name of a common beer, why is the virus called Corona? Call me back in five minutes. Um, Dr. Martin, this is more to your uh, expertise. Uh, can, can you hear this? Yeah. Well, what is the reason it's called a coronavirus? What has what corona got to do with the virus's name? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Martin. Uh, oh, okay. I think that the um, if you look at the virus particle under an electron microscope, uh, you'll see that it's um, it has a a lot of spikes sticking out of it, and these spikes apparently give it. Uh, I guess if you use your imagination, the appearance of a halo or a corona. So these that's how it got its name. Uh, I, I'm going to on that next week. So um, if you could tune in next week, maybe I can give you maybe a better explanation for this. I, I also have a, a chat question from Ms. Theed, who asks about soap and water. Uh, does the kind of soap make a difference, antibacterial versus regular soap? Um, antibacterial helps with bacteria, not with viruses. It's the soap itself the lipophilic part of the soap that helps you get the viruses off the skin. Purposes. Good question. All right. Great. All right. Well, Dr. Hill, thank you so much. Dr. Martin, thank you for being available for um, questions. Thank everybody for uh, tuning in today. We will have another series of talks next Tuesday. So um, we'll look forward to that. Oops, and uh, and I'll um, I'll hopefully I'll get Dr. Hill's slides and send those around um, if anybody was hoping to see those uh, websites. So thank you very much, so Dr. Hill. I've got other calls coming in. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Sorry, I've got other okay. calls coming in. So Busy man. I'm going to take us out if I can. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. All right, I'm just finishing something up. Thank you.